Hi, this is Michael Buffer, and welcome to the Box Hard Podcast. Hello, everyone. This is Mikey Garcia. It's the monster from the swamp, Regis Ruru Program. Hey, what's up? This is King Carlos Molina, former IBF world champ. This is Michael, the bounty hunter, 2012 Olympian and your people's champ. This is Charlie Edwards, flyweight champion of the world. This is Fast Eddie Chambers, and you're listening to the Box Hard Podcast with my main man, Joey Kosmo. Hello, everybody, and welcome to episode 203 of the Box Hard Podcast. I'm your host, Joey Coastman. I'm joined this week, as always, really, by the infamous Mr. Ayaz Sumer. I say, as always, when he is able to be found, Mr. Ayaz Sumer. Ayaz, how are you doing? I'm good, Joey. Yourself? Very good, my friend. Very good. Right, let's dive straight into the review part of the show. We're going to start here uh, last Saturday, the 31st of August, Obviously, uh, we're going to start here at the Bendigo Stadium in Victoria, Australia. Um, a shock, actually, a real shock. Jeff Horn, former world champion, um, only his 22nd fight. He was obviously still at middleweight um, after he took on the guy whose who, whose name has completely slipped me, uh, Mundine. When he when he took him on at middleweight, he's still lingering for some reason at middleweight. He took on Michael Zarafa, former opponent of Kel Brook. That one was for the WBA Oceana and the WBO Oriental middleweight titles. Horn was actually on his backside in the second round and also in the ninth round, and that was where the uh, the referee finally waved it off there was a knockdown in the ninth round and to be honest the referee shouldn't have let it carry on but he did and Horn was completely done shocking that's a huge upset for me I mean Zarafa had a few moments against Kel Brook but you know Kel Brook I think he's at the at the very last stages of his career now and he was with a new trainer and stuff like that so you know we give Kel Brook a little bit of a pass but he still had moments Zarafa I'm not taking that away from him and Jeff Horn a guy I thought would probably be able to you know win the fight with relative ease being at that higher level certainly um you know the 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 fighters that he's mixed it with namely Manny Pacquiao and Terence Crawford um you know I just thought he'd have too much for Zarafa but I did say it could be interesting purely because Jeff Horn is definitely not a middleweight but anyway um he he was beaten and beaten fairly there so quite a shock actually looking at that but moving out now to the O2 Arena in Greenwich, London, United Kingdom. There wasn't too many places that had boxing on um, last weekend, but there was there was obviously a big card here. It was on pay-per-view. Let's start with the main event, Ayaz. Vasily Lomachenko, arguably one of the best fighters ever to step foot in Britain. It was a pleasure to have him here. It was for the vacant WBC World Lightweight title. And also, Lomachenko defended his WBA Super and his WBO World Lightweight titles. A unanimous decision over 12 rounds in favor of Lomachenko. Um, it's, it's what I went with. I went with Lomachenko to get the points win. So did you, Ayaz. I think the listeners went with Lomachenko by knockout. I'll have to quickly double check that one. But yeah, I mean, gutsy effort from Luke Campbell. He was down in the 11th round, but he got back up and he heard the final bell. And um, he had his moments, Luke Campbell. He had his moments. He was very brave. I'm going to give a more thorough breakdown in a moment, but I'm going to throw it over to you, Ayers. What did you make of that fight there? Usually, like, we could have Lomachenko pitch perfect performance, but it wasn't the best performance from Lomachenko, in, in my opinion. But what it was a, what a brave performance by Luke Campbell. Obviously, he got dropped, but, I mean, to be fair, Lomachenko is pound for pound, uh, from my opinion. I think, he's not, I think he's the best fight on the planet at the moment. Obviously, Luke, um, I think what it was, I think, size matter to Luke, uh, Luke Lomachenko in this fight and obviously that's why it wasn't really the best performance but I mean Luke Campbell should take a huge credit from this fight I mean um, he, he had held his head high up and I think in the future he is going to actually become a world champion in my opinion but I mean a great win for, for a great um, a, a big a good win for uh, Lomachenko in the UK yeah I mean the one thing that worries me about Luke Campbell we all we all hope he's going to be a world champion in the future, but he's he's going on at the end of this month. He'll be 32. So even though again he looks about 17, he's really up there in age. But you'd 
you'd say his chance had probably come round if Lomachenko were to move down and vacate the belts and it would free up a few opportunities, I think probably with the WBA mainly. Um, but yeah, there's all sorts of things we're hearing. Apparently, Javante Davis has now moved up as well. So there's lots and lots of things that could happen. Uh, the fight itself, I mean, the first round, I actually gave it to Luke Campbell. I mean, he came out, um, he used his, his reach, he used his size... Um, you know, he was able to keep Lomachenko at bay at times there. It was very much a feel-out round, though. I mean, I was glad to see that Campbell didn't freeze. You know, he, he did let go of his backhand a couple of times. Lomachenko didn't really throw anything at all. He was just kind of applying that mental pressure, which he does so well. Him and Alexander Usyk. So, first round to Campbell. The second round was a close round. I mean, there was some great body work from Campbell. Lomachenko was much more active in that round. Um, it was possibly a Lomachenko round, but it was it was a close one. I mean, it was it was it was a close one to be fair. The third round, it was an exciting round, but definitely a Lomachenko round. That's where he started to take over. He started to open up more. Both men did. Uh, Lomachenko landed a lovely straight left hand. Campbell landed a nice uppercut in that round. It was good action, but certainly a Lomachenko round. The fourth was probably kind of more of the same, I'd say. Uh, Lomachenko won that round also. The fifth round, it was a good round, but Lomachenko landed a lovely left hook late on in the round, and it certainly hurt Campbell. He then seemed to hurt Campbell to the body right after that, and Campbell looked in trouble, and the bell went at a very good time for him. So, like I say, Lomachenko starting to dominate three rounds back-to-back, -back, or even four if you gave him round two. Um, in the sixth round, there was some great action on display. Campbell responded well after being hurt in the previous round. Once again, he landed nice shots to the body of Lomachenko, way more than anyone else had landed to the body of Lomachenko, probably ever. Um, I was starting to think, was it going to take a toll on Lomachenko? Was it going to slow him down? Because, you know, we, we're still yet to work out what it's going to take to beat Lomachenko. We think it's probably going to be size where he keeps moving up these weights and he's, he's you know, he's given away a lot of advantages in the, the height department, the reach department, but he's still good enough with his skill set to beat some of these bigger guys. Um, again, Lomachenko in that sixth round displayed some amazing footwork. His reflexes were excellent. He knows exactly when to jump in and out of range. He's just a subliminal fighter all round. And it was brave stuff from Campbell. Big heart. We know that. We saw that in the in the Linares fight. Uh, the seventh round, the second half of the fight, it was a better round from Campbell early on. He landed a bomb on the chin of, of Lomachenko. It was a left uppercut, I believe. Um, he made Lomachenko hold on, which we don't see too much. But Lomachenko quickly turned the tables and seemed to hurt Campbell. So a brilliant round there in the seventh. In the eighth round, we saw some excellent action. Lomachenko and Campbell were going toe-to-toe -to -toe on the inside. Lomachenko was picking uh, up the majority of the rounds. But Campbell was having moments. He was being competitive. He was banging it out with Lomachenko. Um, already at that point, I felt to myself, Campbell had done us proud. You know, he, he, he'd, he'd fought a good fight. Uh, the ninth round, again, a Lomachenko round. The tenth round, again, a Lomachenko round. He was just kind of nicking these rounds. They were competitive, but he was doing enough. He was looking good. In the eleventh round, that's where Campbell was forced to take a knee after quite a lot of punishment. The first shot that got him in trouble was that left hook to the body, followed by a straight right to the body, right in the solar plexus. But Luke got up bravely, held on, and Lomachenko actually let him have a breather. He actually backed off of him and signaled with his gloves, like, yeah, have a little breather. I'll have one too. You know, he's... Uh, He's quite a showman at times. In the final round, though, the 12th round, uh, Lomachenko closed the show nicely. He won the round. He hurt Luke a couple of times. Luke then hit him low, and he bought himself some time. He also threw him on the floor and bought some time there, Luke Campbell, showing those you know, those experienced little tactics there. But, you know, he got through it. And as I called it, Lomachenko on point. So did you, I had. So we both gain a point, like I say. Commiserations for Luke Campbell, but he done us proud. He needs to, you know, stay positive, which he will do. Um, you know, it's not going to be the easiest pill to swallow because Luke Campbell has got belief in himself off the chains. So um, he 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 will be quite disappointed that he lost. He would have gone into that 100% in his mind thinking he was going to win. So it's going to probably take him a little while to get over it. But he's a positive character. Like I say, tons and tons of belief. And that little hiccup there won't get in the way of his plans for sure. So all the best to him and Shane McGuigan. Not so much back to the drawing board because he fought a good fight. And he's announced his, his name on the scene once again. He's right up there with the world level fighters. But... Lomachenko is a bit of an out-of-this-world fighter. Um, 
Moving down the undercard, let's talk about Charlie Edwards, Ayers. This is one we didn't see coming. Um, myself and you, Ayers, went with Charlie Edwards on points. I think the listeners went with the same. Let me double check. Yes, they did. All across the board, we thought that Edwards would, would win on points. Um, it was a strange one, though. It was a real strange one. Um, after three rounds, Charlie Edwards was, was actually dropped in, in, the, in the third round. And when he, well, he, he took a knee. Let's let's just clear that up. I'm not making a good, not doing a good job of this straight away. He took a knee. He was hurt. He took a, a real onslaught from the big puncher, Julio Cesar Martinez. And when he took a knee, while he was down and clearly down, Martinez decided to throw a huge left hook to the body of, or, or the rib cage of a completely, you know, unprotected Charlie Edwards. And straight away, you could see the facial expressions change. He was in... He was in terrible pain, terrible pain, and he couldn't carry on. And that shot there obviously ended the fight. The referee um, made a bad call, made a big mistake. He didn't call it at all, and he counted Charlie Edwards out. But thankfully, Mauricio Suleiman got in the ring afterwards and said it was it was a no contest. So straight away there, uh, the result got changed, and Charlie Edwards managed to retain the title. Um, just complete bizarre there, Ayers. What did you What did you make of the whole thing? I mean, it was a bizarre. Obviously, Charlie Ed just got dropped, but then that illegal punch that that just obviously finished finished him. But I mean, obviously, thank God for Mercy, Mercy Solomon being there. Um, obviously, with uh, if it wasn't from if it wasn't from Mercy Solomon's decision, um, he would have won the fight. But I mean, fair play. I mean, Charlie Ed was still the champion in football. You got VAR. I remember Eddie Hearn saying that they need something like a VAR system for boxing as well. So I think that'd be really good if it happens in boxing. Yeah, I think that's another topic for another day, but. I can't see how that's going to work, you know. They they pause a football match to to review VAR. They couldn't really pause a boxing match to review VAR to see if it was a knockdown or wasn't while the other guy is is recovering from from the knockdown if it was, you know, a legitimate knockdown, stuff like that. So I can't see how that's going to work, but interesting thought anyway. Um you know, you're right. If 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 Mauricio Suleiman wasn't there, then Charlie Edwards was losing his belt right there. And I'm, I'm not quite sure why Suleiman was even in London for that fight. He doesn't travel for all WBC world title fights. But anyways, he was there. Uh, the first round, Martinez was mixing up his shots. He was you know, was showing a bit of variety. Edwards, his face started reddening it quite a little bit already. And Edwards seemed to take a, you know, a couple of big-looking shots. He was just jabbing Edwards, trying to keep his man at bay. Uh, the second round, again, Edwards was just tapping with his shots. Martinez was the one landing the hard shots. It was a hard round to score in the second. I think the first probably just just about went to Charlie on the jab. And then, of course, the drama, the third round, that big left hand, uh, followed by a complete, complete onslaught. I mean, he threw, I think it was over 20 unanswered punches on on the head and body of Charlie Edwards. Credit to him, he showed toughness. He took him, he, he stayed on his feet, and then he had to take a knee. And it was clever stuff. He's been there before. He's been hurt in a world title fight. He's been down, and he took a knee. It was smart stuff. He had his wits about him. And like I say, when he was on his knees, and he, he was completely not expecting to be hit, I think a second had gone by. Um, while he was on the ground so he certainly wasn't expecting to get hit and he got hit with just a huge huge left hook to a completely unguarded rib cage and that shot just folded him in half I mean Charlie's face like I say changed completely he was he was in excruciating pain he was rolling around and he couldn't beat the count and for a few minutes it, it was quite weird because you know it was a cheap shot and it was unclear of what was going to happen and like you said credit to Maurizio Suleiman he ruled it a no contest in the post-fight interview um, I felt I almost felt a tiny bit sorry for Martinez just a little bit I mean Charlie's my friend but I felt a little bit sorry for him because he was he was he was doing excellently well you know he's he's beaten Andrew Selby and he's come over here it was his big chance and the fight was going his way let's get it right and a moment of stupidity has cost him and now he goes back to Mexico um, you know, credit to Suleiman, once again, I've said it many times, but Suleiman being a Mexican to go against his native fighter, that's that's quite ballsy, really. Um, again, I'm sure they'll try and do something for him, but he was celebrating, you know, he was he was loving it, and then all of a sudden, no, it's it's been overturned. So I felt, I felt a little bit sad for him in that department, but of course, I'm happy that Charlie, by hook or by crook, remains champion. Um... Yeah, I think Bellew probably nailed it in the in the in the uh, the you know you know the 
post-fight discussion kind of thing. Bell, you said, you know, every time Martinez hit um, Charlie Edwards, he was hurting him, and the writing was on the wall what was going to happen. You know, that's that's fair for him to come out and say that. I think Charlie Edwards does need to move up in weight. He was obviously a super flyweight before he came down in weight. He hadn't made the weight for quite a while. He come down to flyweight. And he won the title, but um, yeah, that's probably it. That's his short reign probably over, I'm guessing. I think he should move up. Um, he was looking strong, you know, really, really strong. He hadn't fought on the world level scene, but he was blowing people away domestically. And, you know, when he moved down in weight, he moved up in level, and then he wasn't getting the knockouts. He wasn't the, the power puncher that he, you know, he was in a few fights at Superfly, so it'd be interesting, he's he's already become WBC world champion, so he's already achieved his goal, I'm very proud of him, um, that's it for that one though, like I say, Charlie Edwards still has the record 15-1, and one. he's got the no contest there, and Julio Cesar Martinez 14-1, and one, one no contest, denied his own chance of becoming a world champion, his own stupidity lost him the fight. On the undercard again, Huey Fury against Alexander Povetkin. I want to try and go through this pretty quickly. It was for the vacant WBA international heavyweight title. Um, well, I mean, the first round, for me, Fury got the round. Nice jabs, as expected. Fury was happy to mix it up in the first round. I was a little bit surprised by that. I thought... Um, Huey would just try and keep him at bay and not really sit in the pocket, but he did at times, and Povetkin was struggling to get past Fury's jab. In the second round, which I call the fixed round, um, you know, there was lots and lots of money being betted that apparently Povetkin was going to take a dive in the second round. I've never heard something so stupid as that in my life. Um, it was more of the same from Huey Fury. Good work. Povetkin was respecting um, Huey's power a lot. He, he looked a little bit bewildered at times, and I wasn't really sure why. Povetkin was repeatedly backing up willingly as well. Um, you know, really showing the respect to Huey Fury. In the third round, again, it was all it was all the boxes being ticked from Huey Fury. Very mature performance from him. Very nice movement and shot selection. Povetkin was throwing the odd nice shot, but he seemed to be a few paces behind Huey. And then in the fourth round, it was a closer round. Povetkin once again was having his moments, but it was more than likely a Huey round in my opinion. So I gave him the first four there. Um, five, six, and seven, not much happened, really. It seemed to be a period where Huey just seemed to slow down a little bit. And in the eighth round, that was where Povetkin started landing big shots on Huey Fury. And for a 39-year-old man, Povetkin looked brilliant. I mean, I'd like to see him against Luis Ortiz, by the way, the two 39-year-olds. But again, in this eighth round, Huey was showing a brilliant chin. It's not the first time he showed a brilliant chin in his career. The ninth round was where Huey Fury got a cut eye and... Again, he had to show his iron chin. It was a bad round for Huey, and Povetkin was starting to sink big shots in. I, I was hoping that Huey didn't let the cut get to his head like he did uh, let a cut get to his head, perhaps in the Pulev fight. You know, he couldn't afford to let it worry him too much. In the 10th round, it was a closer round. It was a hard round to score. The 11th round, again, Huey had to take some monster shots, and I expected Huey to have more in the gas tank out of the two. But to my surprise, it seemed like Povetkin was probably the fresher in the later stages, even at 39. So that was that was a bit worrying, actually. Huey's chin, again, solid as hell. Um, I felt he'd need a big 12 round, perhaps, to pinch it, and he didn't have a big 12 round. Povetkin won that round for me. I wasn't strictly scoring the fight all the way through, but I felt like Huey probably racked up a bunch of the early rounds, and he lost a lot of the late rounds. I mean, he was just nicking rounds early on, whereas Povetkin was, was winning rounds quite clearly. I felt it was going to, you know, going to be a close fight on the scorecards, but it was anything but that. Very wide, actually, in favor of Povetkin, to my surprise. All three judges had it exactly the same. 117, 111, 2 Povetkin. Um, where does Huey Fury go from here, Ryaz? It's, 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 a, it's a difficult one because we haven't really found out any more about him. I mean, he lost to Pulev. He's now lost to Povetkin. Those are two guys I've always thought are on the same kind of level, Pulev and Povetkin. Um, you know, he could have beat Parker, but he didn't get the decision. He's still he's still at the same kind of level. He's, he's above domestic. You'd think he's probably above European, but maybe he should just drop down to European perhaps. I don't know. What do you think? I think he's still too way too young. I think he needs to work on his strength and conditioning a lot. He's very like slow as well. Um, for me, I think you know, a really good fight with him would be him versus Carlos Takam. I think that would be a really good level for him. To step up first, and then I think he should fight the big guys. I think he's still young. He's only twenty three years old at the moment. He's still young as well. He's still developing as a fighter. 
obviously, um, he's fought he's fought some very good guys, and obviously, but if he worked on his strength and conditioning, well, I think he'd really be really good. But I think his next, if I was him, I think he should fight someone like a Takam or a Chizora, and I think that'd be a really good fight for him. And I think he, I think he'll beat him, or even a David Price. Yeah, interesting fights. Okay, yeah, I like the Price fight for him actually. Um, I think he's 24, by the way. Could be wrong. But moving down the undercard once again, Joe Cordina against Gavin Gwynn. The two Welshmen got it on, both undefeated. Um, Cordina had a point deducted in the seventh round for a low blow. Gwynn had a point deducted in the ninth round for hitting Joe Cordina in the back of the head. It was for the Commonwealth and British lightweight titles. Cordina got the win unanimously over 12 rounds. Josh Buatzi took on the previously never been stopped Ryan Ford 16-4. and four. Um, Buatzi defended his WBA international light heavyweight title. Ford was down prior to the KO that came in the 7th round and um, what basically happened was well, it was a strange finish. You know, it was a decent fight, actually. There was a, there was a few times where Ford had his moments hitting Buatzi with straight shots and stuff like that. Um, but yeah, it was it was weird how it finished because Buatzi seemed to hit Ford low, and then when he hit him low, Ford bent over. You know, like like ow. You know, like if you get hit in the nuts, you kind of bend forward. And when he bent forward, Buatzi hits him in the back of the head, like downwards. You know, and then he goes down, and then the referee counts him out. So he feels like he was hard done by. And I've actually seen him on social media trying to appeal the decision. He saw what happened in the in the Charlie Edwards fight. He wants a no contest himself. Uh, also. Also on the bill, James Tennyson picked up a second round KO against Atif Shafiq. That's a brilliant win there for him. It was for the vacant WBA international lightweight title. Shafiq was down prior to the knockout. Um, he, he's just too big and strong, uh, Tennyson, for Shafiq there. He's a, he's a big puncher, Tennyson. He's a strong guy, huge for super featherweight. Now he's moved up to lightweight. He looks big there as well. Uh, Savannah Marshall moved to 7-0, and a win against Daniele Bastieri, who was 2-0, and actually undefeated. Hero's now gone with a fifth round TKO. Uh, Martin J. Wall picked up win number 23. He's got the one loss and the two draws. It was a fifth round TKO against Jose Bendana, who's now 10 and 13 with four draws. Moving out now to the Minneapolis Armory in Minnesota, USA. Um, two fights to mention over here. Firstly on the undercard, big upset here. Money Pal, uh, Money Pal the fourth. He was a real good amateur. He's he's had a name that I've looked at for years. Money Power for well, he's beaten quite a few good kids in the amateurs. He turned over. He was ten and zero. He took on Devon Alexander's brother Vaughn Alexander, who had a good undefeated record after coming out of prison, and um, he, he lost a few fights. One was to Dennis Duglin, and he got in there with Money Power, and he actually calls the upset. So he takes Money Power's O. He gives him a rude awakening there to the pros. Money Power now ten and one. It was a majority decision over eight rounds. So well done there to Vaughn Alexander, now 15 and 3. But the top of that card, the main event was Eris Landy Lara. He moved to 26 and 3 with three draws. It was for the vacant WBA World Super Welterweight title against Canelo's brother Ramon Alvarez. The TKO came in the second round. Alvarez now 28 and 8 with three draws. Alvarez came in um, very much overweight, actually. He was, I think it was, I think it was. Almost five pounds heavier than Eris Landilara. That is just terrible, to be honest there. And yeah, he got knocked out in in the second round. Like I say, Eris Landilara gets a little um, gets a little box ticked, I suppose, in his mind. He wanted to get some kind of revenge on Canelo, so he gets it on his brother. Because again, people forget he really could have he really could have got the decision when he took on Canelo himself. Uh, but that's it for the review part of the show. Just before we wrap up part one, the last thing to do is to welcome our very first guest. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome the four-weight world champion, the living legend, the karaoke king. It is, of course, Mr. Nanito Donair. Nanito, welcome back on the show, my brother. Thank you. Thank you for having me. That was that was an incredible um, <laughs> entrance right there. The karaoke king. I like that. <laughs> that is what you are, Nanito, believe me. So we last spoke back in <laughs> we last spoke back in April. It was just before you were supposed to take on Zolani Tete at the time. Obviously there was an opponent change. You ended up boxing Stephen Young in the end. Uh, give me a couple words on that fight if you can. You looked good, obviously you ended it in brutal fashion in that sixth round. But I just felt more comfortable, you know, getting into this division now. Um, I started to, my body has just, uh, is starting to adapt to 
the speed and and the power and all of that stuff you know so so um i mean it takes time for for my body to gradually feel it and i felt that you know i'm I'm primed for this weight class again you know i feel really good i feel i feel my power and i feel my speed as well so you know and it showed in that last fight and on to the next one. You've made it to the final. You'll be taking on Naoya Inoue on November the 7th in Japan. Now, Inoue is a man that you actually said to me early on in the tournament, you do at some point want to fight this guy. The fear factor is something that you actually enjoy. Am I right in saying that? Yes. Uh, you know, I, I think that it's more of the excitement of, of fighting a, a big name and, 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 you know, a tough kid, a talented kid. You know, that's that's what that's what I live for, man. I live for for those challenges. And there, of course, was a little period in which things promotionally uh, promotionally were quite slow. I don't think you knew exactly what was what was going on with the final. What exactly happened from your point of view? What can you tell us, Nanita? There's a few of us a little bit worried that the final might not actually take place. Well, we um, we reached out to them and we couldn't get back. They, they couldn't get anything back from them and you know and we were kind of just worried what was going on and um you know we were just left in the in, in the blank without without knowing anything and and so we just kind of went out there and and you know i think it was during the pacquiao fight that we just you know we're just kind of waiting for for the fight and after that that's when they came back to us and and created a schedule um but before that we didn't have any uh connecting uh connection with them or, or or heard anything from them so but now everything's good and this is where where it's all about yeah for sure and one thing about you nanito that makes this fight very intriguing is that i really don't think an occasion can get the better of you you know you're a positive guy you're loved everywhere you go and more importantly you've seen all of this before so to speak um there's there's no there's no you know worries on your part going to a place like this where you're fighting a hometown favorite that kind of thing doesn't get in your head at all no you know as a fighter we fight any for me at least it's just inside that ring it doesn't matter where it is my that 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 ring is my home you know I could be in, in somebody's house <laughs> in their living room and you put that ring in, it's my house, you know. So that's the mentality that I have going inside the ring. It doesn't matter where it is. And of your previous opponents, Nanito, you've boxed pretty much every style possible. Who do you feel of your prior opponents has got the more similar style or the most similar style to, to a guy like Inoue? Um, I, if I hadn't, Taking out Montiel, I think it would have been in a similar way of fighting. Um, you know, I think that that uh, um, Inoue has more of of explosive power, but I think in terms of movement, leg work, and 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 uh, technique and, and style, I think it would have been more similar to uh, to Montiel. But you know, um, it was it, it was I, I mean, I came into that fight thinking it was going to be a very, very difficult fight, but difficult fight can sometimes lead to an, uh, an early ending. You know, if both guys are willing to exchange and, and this fight could do the same thing or it could be a difficult fight. But I think that Montel would have been a, a similar thing if it went to a distance where we can kind of find each other's uh, or taste each other's style, you know. But I think in this fight too, it could, it could do be the same thing. And another fact, obviously, is that you're still unbeaten at bantamweight. Your bantamweight career has obviously been a career of two halves, but you know you look like a rejuvenated version of yourself this time around. Um, you seem to have got that hunger back, Nanito. Like I say, we've spoke many times over the years, and every time I speak to you, you just sound happier and happier. It seems like you, you've really got that hunger back for this fight as well. Yeah, I think for me, it's just more of realizing what I want to do and, and, and where I want to be and not taking things for granted, you know, when you get to the very, very top, you start to ask questions of why and, and where you should go and all that stuff, you know, and I was brought down and now I'm climbing myself back up and I realize where I, I am mentally and, and, you know, and I'm grateful for all the experiences that I have, but mainly I know where I'm going. And one thing about Inoue is that, of course, he's known for his devastating power. You're known for yours, too. Um, in your honest opinion, Nanito, how do you see this fight playing out? Can you see it in, in any way going 12 rounds? Because I can't. 
<laughs> well, it depends on on his style and my style. To you know, the main thing is to win victory, uh, to 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 win uh, in this fight. Um, you know, there's more likely a bigger probability of the fight not going to the distance. I mean, there is a possibility of everything else that can happen, but um, I I believe that the probability is very low for a, for a decision. Yeah, I agree. Um, I want to, I want to say it to you. You probably know this anyway, but obviously in last year's world boxing super series tournament, Alexander Usyk, of course, won the cruiserweight, uh, the, the cruiserweight competition that they did. And he did that by winning each fight in his opponent's backyard. So you're already two and O in this tournament, going to both of your opponent's backyards. Maybe he laid out the blueprint because you're going to Japan. If you do this, you've done exactly what you seek that. Maybe, maybe it's a secret little ingredient there. <laughs> maybe it is, you know, I mean, I, he, he's an incredible fighter. Um, I think that, I think the most uh, biggest ingredient is, is the, the confidence and, and the ability to learn. I mean, I, I looked at that fight in, in Usyk's fight and just how incredible he is for a big guy to to move the way he does, it just is is incredible. And 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 you know, you just look at it, and in 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 the previous mind, we would be like, that's that's impossible for a big guy to to move the way he does, like a like a little Lomachenko, you know, <laughs> or like a big Lomachenko, you know, it's it's incredible. And and you just come to realize that there is nothing impossible in this world. You know, and and for me, I come into this this uh this ring now thinking that you know what. I, I got this, and I still got this. Yeah, you certainly do, Nanita, believe me. And uh, finally, just before I let you go, I want to give you an opportunity just to send out a closing message to your UK supporters, Nanita. I don't have to tell you how much the UK loves you. We we would love to see you become victorious in this fight here for sure. Man, I am truly grateful for you guys. And again, I can never, ever stop saying this. You guys are the best fans in the world because you guys sing you guys dance you guys drink you guys get loud and you guys get really passionate and i'm so grateful for that for the support and but mainly all i can do is give you guys the best of me and you guys will enjoy it definitely and i'm thoroughly looking forward to it listen anito thank you so much for your time best of luck out there in japan on november 7th and we'll definitely speak sometime after my brother thank you very much and thank you for always having me Okay, now it's time for part two on this week's show. This part, of course, the news part of the show. I has what you got? The first, the first news that I got is Agit Kabayel has vacated his European title. Yeah, Agit Kabayel, a guy that holds a win, a good win, by the way, in Monaco over Derek Chisora. He's vacated his EBU heavyweight title. Basically, what it seems like, anyway, was was uh, to avoid Joe Joyce because I think purse bids were going to get called earlier this week. And he has vacated it just before they got called, something like that. So it seems like he doesn't want any part of Joe Joyce. So hopefully Joe Joyce fights in his next fight for the European. And, um, you know, there's a there's a list of guys I'd like to see him in with, to be honest, Joe Joyce. So uh, I think he's even calling out people like Takam and um, even Big Baby Miller, I think, is on his list. So interesting. I'd like to see those big fights, whether it's for the European. That would be nice if not then uh, it is what it is. He's got to get moving fast anyway, Big Joe Joyce. So um, the big news is that on October 26th, uh, live on uh, live from Sky Sports uh, box office, Regis Progress will face Josh Taylor, and on the undercard will be um, Derek Chisora versus Joseph Parker, Ricky Burns versus Lee Selby, and Lawrence Okoli. Yeah, Lawrence Okoli fights for the European Cruiserweight title. Pro Graham Taylor, of course, it's the World Boxing Super Series final. We'll be speaking to Regis Pro Gray uh, later on in the show. Um, Derek Chisora against Joseph Parker, brilliant fight. A fight I never thought would actually happen, but I think Joseph Parker wins that one. Like I'm real confident. Um, that he wins that one actually if anyone doesn't agree with me then tweet me on twitter um, let me know what you think about that fight because that's an interesting one there um, style wise but I think Parker wins that one all day so if you disagree please tweet me um, or just tweet me to say yeah I think that Parker wins if you agree with me and um, as you say uh, Lee Selby Against Ricky Burns, obviously the fight at lightweight. I think Burns was it Burns when he fought Crawler. I can't remember if that was at one three five or one forty, but I think one of them wanted to move up to one forty. I think it was Burns, so I think they're pulling Burns down from one forty back to one three five. I think where he doesn't really want to fight anymore. And of course, Lee Selby's moved up from 
from uh, from from featherweight. So you can't ask him to go up to one forty. But it's going to be interesting because Lee Selby didn't look great when he boxed on the Eubank and Degal on the card, and he just about got through that fight by the skin of his teeth. And even though I think Ricky Burns is so badly over the hill, he is still a tricky guy. He's probably better than I think it was Omar Douglas who Lee Selby fought. He's probably still better than him. So um, it could be interesting. It's going to be a good fight. It definitely goes the distance. We know that for sure. Um, I'd be stunned if there's a knockout in that fight. Yep, and finally, the, uh, the last news is that Alexander Usyk will face Tyron Spons on October the 12th in in Wind Trust Arena in Chicago. Yeah, Alexander Usyk. I mean, we, we thought we were going to see him against uh, Carlos Takam originally, and obviously that fight fell through. Usyk got injured, and now we get Tyron Spong again. It's a guy that we don't know tons about. Um, 14 and 0 with 13 knockouts. He's from the Netherlands. He's 34 years of age. His nickname is King of the Ring, by the way. But um, yeah, I mean, you look down his resume. Italo Pereira's on there. He's boxed one guy who was 0 and 14, and then he boxed another guy after that who was 0 and 15. Oh boy. Um, yeah, I mean, nothing. Nothing great on this on this on this resume to be honest. So Usyk wins that one with ease. That's a little bit like Arnold Gurdjieff, who um, who David Hay fought that time. He's up there with the likes of uh, of um, who did uh, Tom Schwartz. He's up there with these kind of guys. Otto Wallin. They're all around the same kind of level. But we're going to give Usyk a pass because it is his first fight at heavyweight as a pro. So. Yeah, we'll, we'll look the other way. Um, hopefully the undercard is going to be good for that one. Um, I think there's no fight that's been announced for it just yet, but hopefully it's a good undercard. So, uh, yeah, interesting to see how he looks at heavyweight, of course. Yep, and that's it for the news. Okay, thank you very much, Ayaz. Moving over to the preview part of the show, it's going to be real, real quick because there's only two fights to mention. One takes place at the Karokian Hall in Tokyo, Japan. It's gone under the radar, but it's the return of Jorge Linares. It's going to be his 51st fight, 45-5, and five, coming off that first round knockout to Kano in his last fight. He returns in a 10-rounder against Al Toyogon, who is 10-4 and four with one draw. So, uh, yeah, Linares making a, a return to the ring there under the radar. I say that, the Karokian Hall is is such a big boxing venue. It's like the York Hall of 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 you know the UK. It's like that, but it's the York Hall of of, of Japan. There's fights there every single week. It seems so. Um, I'm saying it's under the radar, probably because in Britain we didn't know much about it, but in Japan I'm sure they're loving it because of course he he lives in Japan, Linares. So uh, it's, it's it's you know he's fighting pretty much in his home city now. He's adopted home city. And moving to the final bill to mention, we just mentioned the venue. York Hall, Bethnal Green, London, on the Saturday night here, the 7th of September. Um, on the undercard, one fight that I just want to draw everyone's attention to right here. Wadi Camacho, 21-8. and eight. He takes on Dion Juma, 11-0. and 0. It's for the vacant English cruiserweight title. Dion Juma, still undefeated, like I say. He's a guy that... Um, that's kind of had a bit of a stagnated career, really. Um, I remember him, I think he was fighting in Germany for a while. I think he was even promoted by the Sauerlands, if I'm not mistaken. Um, and, yeah, I remember him being on the couch on Box Nation with Steve Bunce years ago, and he's only had 11 fights, so he's really just been... I don't know what's happened. He's been promoted bad or managed bad or something. He's been so quiet, and this is his first fight against someone that I've actually heard of, I think, the first opponent that that, uh, that I know of. So um should be interesting because, obviously, Camacho is uh, he's like the York Hall champion. He's, he's a tough guy at York Hall, so it won't be easy there. Be interesting to see how Juma looks because, again, future opponents for him are the likes of Akoli if he's not moved on, um, Isaac Chamberlain, those type of guys there. Um, and is there anything else to mention on that undercard? No, there isn't. No, there isn't. So that is everything. Uh, that's everything for the preview part of the show. I told you it'd be quick. Just before we wrap up the show entirely, the last thing to do, of course, as always, is to welcome our second and final guest. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome the undefeated WBA super, super lightweight world champion. He is, of course, Mr. Regis Progre. Regis, welcome back on the show, my man. Oh, man, thanks for having me, bro. How's everything? Everything's good. How are you? How's your new (laughs) t-shirt? Oh, everything's good, man. Everything is wonderful, bro. Thank you. 
No problem, my man. So, Regis, we last spoke back in May. Uh, it was just after your win over Kirill Relic. At the time, you know, you told me even though Taylor and Baranchik were still yet to fight at the time, you preferred, if it was up to you, to fight Taylor. Taylor, of course, won the fight. Mm-hmm. You were sat ringside. Now you've got what you want. Firstly, though, what did you make of Taylor's win over Baranchik? What did you see? I mean, um, I saw. For for me, the thing is, when I go to the fights, I just I, I look at you know I go as a fan, you know I go as I'm not really scouting, you know I'm just going as you know as a fan and you know just going to have fun and I enjoyed the fight. It was a real good fight. Um, they went at it. Um, just like I thought. I mean, I, I thought just like how I thought it was gonna happen. You know, that's that's exactly what happened. You know, I, I felt like Taylor was gonna get the unanimous decision. He was, you know, he was gonna beat him, but I I, I felt like you know it was gonna be a tough fight for him and. They was going to go to war, and um, that's kind of what they did. And um, like I said, that night I was a fan, and I went to Scotland and I had fun that night, you know. So, um, but I, like I said, I wasn't, he, he, I mean, you watching, you know, you're going to fight either one of them. But um, it's not like I was, like, scouting or nothing like that. I was just out there having a good time. Absolutely. And Josh Taylor himself, I mean, I'm sure um, for quite a while you've heard how good he is. As you say, you watched him live, you were there as a fan. I mean, did you see anything that you perhaps didn't know? Did he impress you any more than what you thought he, you know, how good he was before? Not really. I, mean, I, I knew how, I think, you know, I, I mean, as far as skill wise, I know how good he was, um, you know, and that's, that's kind of what he showed. You know, I think one thing he did show, um, maybe that, maybe, um, that I didn't see before is like he did, he got cut and, you know, he, he, you know, he got cut early, I think maybe in the fifth or sixth round and, you know, he finished the fight with the cut and, you know, he just kept fighting basically, you know, but, um, now, I mean, my, my opinion, you know, basically stayed the same about him. Will Josh Taylor be your toughest fight so far as a pro? Is he your best opponent, do you feel? It's supposed to be. It's definitely supposed to be. You know, they all say it about, you know, every fight. They say, you know, it's supposed to be your toughest opponent. It's supposed to be your toughest opponent. I mean, the thing is, you never know until you fight the person. You never know until you get in there with them and fight them. But, um, of course, you know, on, on paper, it's, it's definitely, he's definitely supposed to be my toughest fight to, to date. So, um, you know, it'll be interesting. It'll be, you know, hopefully it'll be interesting. It'll be a fun night. And it looked like for a while that the fight might not happen. We had to wait quite a while for an announcement. I know that you were not even sure yourself if the fight would go ahead. Um, do you know the ins and outs of what actually happened? Why there was so much of a you know a long period without hearing anything? Um, I mean, it, I mean, uh, it was just things going on with the with the World Boxing Super Series that you know that they had to get basically like um, financial wise they had to get together you know and um once they got together then you know everything was planned but um for me in in my mind like I always knew I was fighting Josh Taylor next I never planned on fighting nobody else my whole thing was like I I was I knew I was gonna fight him it was just about when when and where that was it um but for me I, I wasn't worried about all that stuff going on with WGSS and you know saying that the fight gonna be this the fight gonna be that canceled and all that I just I wasn't ever looking at it that way. I was always looking at it like, you know, that's going to be my next fight. That's who I want to fight next. And it was too much on the line not to, you know, to pass it up. So that's what, you know, I'm, I'm glad it, it worked itself out now. And, and I'm, I'm, I'm coming to the U.K., and I don't really want to take anything out of context of, of how the way uh, Josh Taylor said it, but I'm sure I read a tweet that he was trying to say you were you were trying to find a way out. You were trying to duck him. Um, am I right mm-hmm. in saying that? Did he did he say that? You're right, no, nah, you're right, yeah. I mean, yeah, they said that it was him and all his fans. And, and you know, this other people and other, they were saying, like, I was ducking them. I was like, what? And the thing is, I couldn't really say nothing about it because of, you know, because of, um, like, it was going through, like, litigation and all that stuff with the WBSF. So I couldn't really say nothing about it. So I just, I kind of read stuff and I was, I was ducking them and all, and I was trying to get out the fight. And, and then, um, I think what, what what made people think that is like because of the Adrian Broner thing. You know, Adrian Broner had called me out and I responded to him. And so, you know, people was like, oh, he trying to duck Taylor to go fight Adrian Broner or easier fight can go fight Broner. And for me, that was never the case. Like, I always wanted to fight Josh Taylor. That was, you know, that's the reason I got in the tournament, to fight the best. And, you know, for me, he is the second best. You know, after myself, he is the second best. So I wanted to fight him. So, of course, I mean, I feel like he's supposed to do that. It was like ammunition and stuff like that. Um, you know, that's, you know, I feel like that's what's supposed to happen. Because if I feel like if if the same thing would happen to him and he would have, you know, some 
financial things or whatever would have happened with him, and he would have said he pulled out the fight, and then some shit happened with Adrian Brown, I would have said, yeah, that motherfucker's ducking me too. So, you know, it, it is what it is. And of course, the fight is yeah. on, it takes place in London on October 26th at the O2 Arena. Um, I'm sure you're looking forward mm-hmm. to coming to London as well as fighting there, but also just coming there to visit as well, Regis. Yeah, definitely, definitely. It's, it's actually, I've been to a whole bunch of places, um, but I've never been to London, y'all. Um, so I can't wait to come, you know. Um, I'm thinking about, um, you know, maybe even after the fight, staying, you know, staying a week or something like that. And, um, you know, just to, you know, just go enjoy, enjoy it out there and stuff like that. But of course, I don't want to get, you know, to, too much in, in front of myself. I, I still, I still gotta, you know, I still gotta fight first before anything. So, but yeah, I can't wait. And, um, you know, I know people, a lot of people say it's like a dream come true to go fight London. For me, it really is. You know, like I, I think about so many greats. You know, I think, you know, Marvin Hagler, he, that's what he, you know, he won his, you know, he won his title over there. He beat an English fighter over there. So, you know, and I want to ask you, Regis, um, about your thoughts on Hooker vs. Ramirez. Yeah. Obviously, it's a little mm-hmm. bit old news now, but it was a great fight. Did you expect it to go the way it went? Uh, nah, I mean, he shocked me that he knocked him out, but I felt like he was going to win. I definitely felt like he was going to win. Um, yeah, I, I mean, I, I felt like Ramirez was going to beat Hooker. I, I didn't think that Hooker can beat Ramirez, you know. Um, but, you know, it was it was a good fight because he, he stopped him in the sixth round, so... He shocked me a little with that, to, you know, that he stopped him. But I mean, overall, it was it was a good night. It was a real good night for him. And you say he shocked you a tiny bit. Taking the fashion that Ramirez won that fight he's into account, do you still think he's not in the top two super lightweights? Is he still three or four, Ramirez? Still three and four to me. I mean, it was three and four at first. It was three and four. It was. I, I feel like me and Josh Taylor is one and two, and him and Hooker is three and four. I mean. He still didn't beat neither one of us, so he's still three and four, three and four fighting each other. Is I, I don't, I don't think he moved up to number one, or number two. I mean, I still think that he, he was expected to do that. It wasn't for me. It wasn't a fifty-fifty fight. It was I, I, I expected Ramirez to win. You know, so it's three fight four and three beat four and three stay at number three. To me, and, you know, of course, other people can think that, think different things, but nah, I just. I think that nah, he, I, for me, I think he stayed at number three. I think he stayed at number three. And of course, you met Tyson Fury the other week at a boxing show. Were you able to speak with a big man at all? Nah, not really. Um, I ain't really talked to him too much. Nah, I mean, um, I just I met him and you know we just kind of laughed a little bit because he was bending down to take a picture with me. And so I was like, bro, don't know, stand up. I don't want you to bend down to my height. Stand up. And I mean, he a, it's a big mother. He's real big. He's, he's super big. But um. Just laughed a little bit, took a picture, and that was it. Did he know who you was? I don't know, to be honest. I don't know if he knew who I was or not. Um, nah, he just, I don't know. I can't tell you or not. I just, we just took a picture, and that was And then um, kind of went about his business. We laughed a little bit, and that was it. Yeah, he probably did know who you were because you'd be quite surprised. He really does study the lower weights and stuff. He pretty much, he's like a walking, talking encyclopedia when it comes to boxing. Um, mm-hmm. I, I'd say he probably yeah. did know who you were. Um, so the fight itself, Regis, just lastly, um, how do you see it playing out against Taylor on the 26th next month? Um, I mean, for me, I always go out and do my thing. I, I, I really can't see how Taylor can beat me, to be honest. I know he has skills and, you know, he's good and he has all this. But, I mean, I feel I just I just can't see how he can beat me. You know, and I'm not just saying that to, I'm not just saying that to, like, to be cocky or arrogant. I just cannot see, like, I just can't imagine him being able to beat me. I just feel like my skills are better. You know, my skills, my power, everything is better, you know. Um, and I'm not saying it to try to convince myself, but that's just what I feel. You know, I'm a, I'm a real confident fighter, and I've been, I'm just real dominant in um, all the time. In all my fights, I'm just a very dominant fighter. And I, as, I mean, that's just, like I said, that's just kind of how I feel. I just, I just don't think that you can beat me, at, you know, at all. You know, I've been, like I said, I've been dominating. And I've been fighting good fighters, undefeated fighters, world champions, former world champions. I've just been dominating. And, you know, like I told him, you know, after this fight with Baranchek, you know, Baranchek hit him with a lot of shots. Baranchek actually really dropped him. They didn't give it to him, but Baranchek dropped him. You know, he hit gloves at the canvas and from a punch and stuff like that. And, you know, like I said, they didn't give it to Baranchek. And Baranchek put a big old gash over his eye. And I told him, you know, like, listen, you, you better go tighten some shit up in the gym. Because if you fight like that against me, like, I'm going to hurt you. Like, if Baranchek did that, 
I mean, you know, Baran, you know, not taking nothing away from Barancha, you know, he's a good fighter, but he's not me. And I'm way more sharp, I'm way faster, and I'm, I'm way more powerful. So, and I got stamina for, for days. So, I mean, if he performs like that against me, you ain't for, you know, he, he could be in for a nightmare. And um, he had, he agreed. <laughs> the thing is, he agreed, his trainer agreed to the same thing. They said, yeah, you know, it's a different fighter, and, you know, we're going to go in the gym, and we're going to tighten some things up to get ready for me. So, but like I said, I just cannot see him. Like I, I just can't see how, like what he can do to 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 be able to beat. Him. I just don't, you know. I just can't see it. Absolutely, cannot wait for that fight to happen. But finally, Regis, have you got any closing words just to our listeners before we let you go? The UK listeners that are listening and supporting you. Man, tell the motherfucking UK I am coming. This is my first time over there, and we're gonna have a blast. And I can't wait to go and just fuck. I just. Like it's, it's gonna be like this is historic for me to in my history. <laughs> All right, listen, Regis, I cannot wait for you to touch oh, down history. in London. The fans are gonna love you here for sure. Best of luck for the fight, and we'll speak sometime after. All right, cool. Okay, and this wraps up episode 203 of the Box Hard Podcast. I've been your host, Joey Coastman. I, as Sumra, has been I, as Sumra. A massive thank you to our two guests on this week's show, the four-weight world champion, the karaoke king, Mr. Nonito Donaire, and, of course, the reigning, undefeated WBA super, world super lightweight champion, Mr. Regis Progray. The prediction league currently stands at myself in the lead on 15 points. I, as is in second place on nine points, and you, the listeners, are on eight points. Points, just one point gained for myself and one point gained for Ayaz this week. The listeners, very unlucky. All three predictions uh, didn't didn't come in, unfortunately, there for you guys. I do want to thank you all, though, for listening to this week's podcast. You are the people that make this show as good as what it is. Remember to tell a friend, to tell a friend, to tell a friend. Please leave us a review on iTunes if you get a chance. And we shall see you all again next week. <laughs>